Uh, thanks. As Fred said, I work at OpenX, and uh, I work on our ad delivery systems. There's a lot of Erlang, but there's also a few other languages sort of in the mix. And when we have a problem, we sort of have to figure out where the problem happened. So, um, and I want to sort of talk slightly about, you know, when I say distributed systems, I'm not using the kind of like academic term that a lot of people might consider where it sort of locks it into a few sorts of systems. I kind of consider almost every web system uh, to, in a sense, be distributed. Um, and any, specifically, any system in which requests can sort of go through different tiers. Um, so, and I've built quite a few of these systems over the past, I don't know, 16, 17 years. Uh, and one thing that I've really learned is that, you know, these web services, they've gotten a lot more complex. Uh, when I first started, things looked like this. And uh, I'm sure there are those of you out there that it looked like this as well. And, problems were a lot easier to diagnose. You really had sort of, you know, one place to look, and that was your Apache log, or maybe your, you know, what was it, NCSA's web server that came before it. Um, and this was, though, still kind of distributed in that you had some web browser on some other machine, and you really didn't have access. You didn't know what was happening other than being able to see what was coming in. Uh, a little bit later, people decided, well, we want to do more than just serve up static pages. So they started to integrate databases and serve up sort of more dynamic content. Uh, and in this case, you really had, you know, what I consider to be kind of the first distributed systems that you would be running in your facility. You know, some people might still call them like a client server system, but in reality, like, you know, you got that connection, you're kind of distributed now. You got two machines that can fail instead of one. Um, and if you're really lucky at that time, well, you might have high traffic. So, oh, we need to actually suddenly have more than one web server. Um, the funny thing is you still tended to have one database. Uh, just because, you know, sharding wasn't really heard of, and you just paid more money to Oracle, and Oracle would just give you a bigger and bigger database, uh, and then eventually you'd realize you're paying so much to Oracle that, you know, wow, okay. Um, and at this point, we were actually, I was also actually working at a company that kind of was acting as a software as a service, which added even more sort of complexity to it, because now you didn't have actual direct access to the web browser. Some other person's server had it, and then there was a server-to-server -server connection to you, and that server-to-server -server may have also been over HTTP, but it sort of added you know, more complexity. If I'm trying to figure out a problem, like I'm very far removed from the user. Uh, sort of late 90s, early 2000s, people decided that app servers were sort of a really good, good idea. I don't know if anybody remembers the, the EJB craze and how much pain that caused a lot of us. Um, so, you know, now we're getting into, you know, even more complex architectures. And, you know, again, if you were sort of lucky or maybe unlucky, suddenly you're having, you know, again, multiple servers at each layer. Um, although, again, you know, the database tended to still be kind of just one big database. Um, and then again, you add in the software as a service. Well, now you got another layer in there. You're not directly talking to the user. Um, so fast forward to sort of where we've gotten to today, and uh, this is kind of that more service-oriented or end-tier architecture, where the app servers have sort of, as a monolithic thing, have been split up into many smaller services, uh, and you tend to run them even, you know, they may be multiple on the same machine, they may be spread across machines, they tend to do, do things like front your databases, front external calls, front calls to, you know, NoSQL services, maybe they do sharding themselves, uh, add in, you know, that software as a service, and, you know, these systems start to look pretty complex. And when requests come in from a user, you know, it could hit sort of any layer of any of those services, because most of the time you're doing, you know, fairly generic round-robin balancing or something like that. Uh, so, you know, the big question is sort of how do I figure out when something's going wrong, how it, how it uh, went wrong? And this is, you know, troubleshooting. And what I've noticed is that what most people do to troubleshoot is, you know, I'm going to go look at the logs for errors. You know, maybe you're capturing performance metrics and you're going to be looking at, like, overall performance to try to decipher when things are happening. Um, you know, maybe you get, like, a vague ticket and you then try to reproduce what happened and sort of uh, maybe you're lucky, maybe you're not. Uh, or you just have a crash and you're trying to figure out what, what happened. Um, and it becomes harder and harder as you have sort of dozens and hundreds of machines in your facility. But if you go out and sort of, you know, do some Google searches for troubleshooting distributed systems, what you really find is more this kind of, um, you know, performance monitoring based uh, troubleshooting, where it's like, uh, usually it's, you know, if you look, dive into the details of like, oh, how I need to change my systems or whatnot, they just have recommend, general recommendations like use NTP and, you know, try to synchronize your IDs, 
um, you know, log a bunch of stuff, uh, and then you know, some magic occurs, or we'll do something smart with that stuff. Uh, and you see this in you know, a few different systems that are out there, but it really is geared towards that performance monitoring side. So really what they end up looking at is kind of things, the amount of time certain subcomponents take and looking at that. And that's very valuable, but um, you know, there are some problems with some of this in that with this traditional approach, a lot of times they say, well, just log everything you, extra you can. And oftentimes that's you know, too much data. And multiple times in this conference, I've heard people talk about like, well, you just sample, sort of bring down the data, um, and that's great. Uh, you know, you're adding overhead for these. Sometimes it's like very low level if you read into some of the things that Google has done with their Dapper, where they sort of fork packets at a very low level and things like that. Or you look at Twitter's Zipkin or the Xtrace things. They all kind of focus on this performance monitoring. Uh, and it's not really like an apl application specific thing. So it can't necessarily answer application specific errors. Um, but when I say sort of application errors, what am I sort of talking about? Uh, this might be, you know, you as a developer trying to debug some issue, and you've got four or five, you know, different subsystems that you're, you know, mucking with, and you're not sure where the problems, you know, where the failures occurring, uh, or you know, customers call into customer support and they say, "I'm seeing this issue right now." Uh, I'm in the ad business. The most common one is, "Hey, I'm on my web page and I'm not seeing the ad I'm expecting to see." And since you are not them and are not on their machine with them, you can't necessarily easily see it. Uh, or our QA department runs across an issue, and the issue ends up being two or three levels down in the stack, it's sort of hidden in a service that's off to the side, uh, and it gets fixed. But then, how do they tell that it was fixed? Well, how do they? Well, how do they find out that it, that was the component that was broken, or how does the developer? Um, and you know, this also goes out to like you know a sales engineer demoing a product. They're going to have these same sort of issues. Um, and there's a lot of things that can kind of cause these issues. So you can have sort of actual kind of bugs in your system that cause these issues. Uh, the biggest one we find, though, is sort of data discrepancies. You know, with these complex systems where you're throwing bits of data here and there and you're relying on different systems to push data to this component and push it there, like sometimes replication is behind or sometimes replication fails for one component or another. Or sometimes a read from disk fails because that particular disk happens to have gone into, you know, some bad mode. Uh, or just, you know, it could be that a service has partially uh, failed in a way that sort of is slightly working but not totally. Uh, and it, a lot of times it can be the sort of pebcac, like, you know, the problem's really at the user side. They just aren't doing the wrong thing. Uh, so having sort of come across this at several times uh, and kind of I've come across what I consider a possible solution to this problem, um, which is the cross-language tracing of specific requests. Uh, so in this case, what happens is we trigger a trace with some sort of external input, and then you know, we're going to log lots of extra stuff during that, but we don't want to load the systems too much, so we're going to log it over UDP to some central place. And then we're going to provide a way to sort of look at the data and you know, inspect, see what was happening at each, at each layer in the system. Uh, and before I sort of show some details of it, I want to kind of talk about the evolution, because this really started for me probably about 14 or so years ago, uh, the first sort of version of this system. Um, so I'm going to go through three use cases that I've had at various points, uh, starting in about 2000 when I was doing search advertising for sort of GoTo slash Overture, then why I was doing a different type of advertising type tech called Content Match at Yahoo, and finally to the system we're using now at OpenX. So search advertising, in case you're not familiar, is that you know when you go to a search engine and you type in some keywords. Uh, you don't just get search results. And you know, you'll see this on your Google search right now. You'll get those boxed results that are advertising results on the top or on the side. Um, and it really comes down to you got some keywords, and you're going to associate keyword, those keywords with ads. And then you're going to pick ads that are sort of relevant in front of, for those particular keywords and stick them in front of the algorithmic results. Uh, Goto.com sort of very pioneered this in the late 90s. Um, we really sort of like took it and ran with it for several years, uh, and eventually, sort of Google, while hunting around to look for how to make money at a search engine, sort of discovered this and copied it. And then there was a lawsuit, and various things happened, but it eventually was all settled, and uh, and so they they then took it and really ran with it much further than than we had, uh, because we really didn't have the algorithmic stuff backing ourselves up. We were mostly acting as a service to other third parties who were running search engines, and that as they all got trampled under, 
we eventually were sold to Yahoo, and then I started working at Yahoo. Um, the GoTo system was, you know, kind of this two-tier uh, distributed system. We had, you know, a lot of web servers. Uh, we are software as a service, so you know, people were making server-to-server -server calls to us to get these results. Uh, and we were, you know, our web server was Apache. We were running Mod Perl. Everything was written in Perl. Our database was Oracle. It's kind of typical for the time, I guess. Uh, and we had this question that would come up, where the account managers for the different people we integrated with would, would sort of come in, and a customer would have said, like, why am I not getting ads, or why am I getting the wrong ads? Uh, and these almost always ended up being some sort of configuration issue, but it was really difficult to determine like what that issue was uh, from the outside. Uh, we had a tool available, which was a library we wrote uh, specifically to do logging of all our um, you know, events that happened. Uh, it's called LOS. Uh, it was sort of much later open source, so you can kind of find it online and, and take a look at it. But it was, uh, it was built to be cross-language from the beginning uh, to support sort of like self-describing uh, events, so you didn't really need to, to build uh, or compile any sort of thing to parse it. You just had a library that would parse it. Uh, you can kind of think of it as throwing sort of dictionaries uh, between different languages. Uh, it actually started out as a Java system, eventually got rewritten in C, and then wrapped uh, with Swig so we could integrate it with Perl. Uh, since then, it's had a bunch of other languages added, uh, including Erlang. So. Uh, we have this tool available. We're already using it everywhere. We're already sending all these events. So we came up with this idea that we called Isotope, because uh, it sort of represented just kind of this particle shooting out of your system from somewhere that you didn't know. Uh, and what we would do is we would sort of like figure out a way to kind of demarcate that this request should be traced. And if you remember, like we were integrating with third-party search engines. They would send us in some keywords on a server-to-server -server call. And so you're like, OK, what's the best way to do it? Well, we'll come up with some secret keywords. And uh, when those secret keywords are in place, we'll actually sort of like put the server into this special mode where it's going to spit out some extra logging information onto the side. Just that one re request you know, is going to be on and off. Uh, you know, we're not looking to sample. We're not doing a lot of stuff. It's really just like, I need to, I, I'm seeing this problem right now. I just want to get extra information that I can't get. Um, these things would get sort of packaged up, and they would be sent over to a server. And we were really just using timestamps to kind of figure out like when a trace occurred. Uh, and inside these packets, we just took like you know the contents of the Perl hash that we were serving with and stuck it into the UDP packet and sent it over, and then wrote it into a file on the other side. And so it really took someone who was kind of knowledgeable about the system to go in and look at it and figure out what was going on. Uh, but that sort of worked. Um, it sort of looked like this. You know, we had a user request that came in. Uh, it had those special keywords. Our web server would pick it up and like shoot off a little LS event. It would get picked up by a listener, written to a file, and then the file would just be served up by a web server. Uh, but we learned a few things with this. Um, you know, timestamps can lead to conflicts. Once the tool got popular enough, people were kind of doing it fairly frequently, and they'd often end up stuck in the same directory or maybe overwriting each other even in the same file. Uh, so that was kind of bad. Uh, we also learned that, well, that structured data was useful because people could kind of take these Perl terms and just essentially source them in Perl and then you know, access them and build little tools to, to analyze uh, what was going on. Uh, and, this, and making the data accessible via a web server was also very useful because people just had an easy way to sort of go and, and get this stuff. Um, and so what this really allowed us to do is like, you know, when someone called in with a problem, we had a a team that was responsible for sort of dealing with uh, you know, external people coming in uh, and saying, hey, I've got this problem. And they were very easy, able, easily able to debug it, because they could essentially go to the person's website, type in these magic keywords, go over to the internal server, find their trace, look in and say, like, OK, the problem is, is that like, you're sending in these wrong you know, values over here, or you're misconfigured in this way. You know, we'll get you fixed up and sorted. So a few years later, we're working on, I was working on content match. Uh, and in this case, the idea is that you look at the contents of a page, sort of derive what the page or the subject of the page is, and then search ads that are relevant to the contents of the page. So you're on a page about shoes, and we might give you Nike ads. Or you know, you're on a page about cars, and we might give you a, you know, a Ford ad or a Toyota ad. So this is sort of our 
first foray into kind of this like n-tiered service-oriented uh, architecture. And we had sort of one like web gateway, and then it pretty quickly just like sent you know information off to a little control process that would then gather data from different places, optimization systems like in-memory databases, sort of combine this all together, decide what we were going to show, and then send the information back out. Uh, I put NoSQL up there, even though this was very it was predated the NoSQL world, but we kind of used some Yahoo technology for having in-memory databases, and just we would shard data and then send requests to the different services. Uh, the other sort of uh, interesting thing about this architecture that's, is that all the internal interconnects were all UDP, uh, and that allowed us to sort of tune our servers to sort of maximize their, uh, their usage. Uh, and it was also all in C, so that was, uh, you know, both, both fun and not fun. Uh, but again, you know, we, even, we sort of like made our problems even worse, because before, where we only had, you know, a few, our architecture was fairly simple, and that it, you know, we do, still just had a few web servers. You really could kind of go through and dig through them. In this case, like, you really had no idea where a request would end up. So the most common use case, or the one that we were trying to solve is, well, the developers would say, where did my request go? Like, what machines did it hit? I mean, I can't even go to find the machine it went to to see if there's a log error. I have to go th look through all their logs. Um, and a lot of things that you don't log, like the specifics of the data that are used to make a particular decision. You know, sometimes those are not things you log because logging is going to be more expensive. And in this case, like, any logging was super expensive because we had these very highly tuned C systems and we were driving the machines at their absolute capacity. Uh, so you really didn't want to ever log anything at least not to a local disk. Um, and again, we had customer support coming back and people saying, like, I don't understand why I'm not seeing ads on this page, or I don't understand why these, these ads were picked for this page. So uh, again, we sort of were using LWS, so we picked it up. Um, and this time, instead of using its straight UDP mode, we actually used the multicast UDP mode, uh, because that allowed us to kind of have uh, multiple things listen to these events um, and we are, they were, it was actually the tool started out, LS started out as just multicast UDP, and UDP was actually added strictly for isotope. So this is kind of going back to the beginning. Uh, and then we had a little command line sort of listener that you could sort of listen to uh, these traces. Uh, and the way we got sort of an I, and then, you know, the system was called LLog. And essentially, again, we were needed a way to sort of demarcate this request. Uh, and in this case, we pretty much knew the requests that were being made because they were made directly from the pages. So you could easily sort of dig up the URL. Uh, and we had a, you know, a secret query arg. Um, you know, uh, whenever I say secret, these are all like extremely like, you know, very poor security. Like if anyone had found it out, they could have like sent a bunch of stuff. But security through obscurity works in a lot of ways. Uh, and it would just take in an integer. And we were using this integer instead of uh, the timestamp. So when the ID came in, we would just check all throughout the system, like, hey, is the ID non-zero? If so, I'm going to spit out some extra information, send it over, over LOS to this, this central place, or in this case, to the multicast uh, channel. And then I have my little listener that I basically tell to listen to all the events for this particular ID. And it would pick them out and sort of print them out. Um, and that was great for developers, but you know, what about those customer support folks who weren't really going to use this command line tool? Uh, for them, we sort of set up a system where you could kind of enable traces on a certain number of requests. And they could do this through like, their sort of UI, and they could say, I want to listen to the, you know, 100 requests for this particular you know, URL. And we would sort of capture all of these and sort of sh shove them into a database. Because essentially, all they really cared about really was like the, re the, the access logs, which we had turned off because they were sort of performance bottleneck. And they really you know, were reliant on access logs and really wanted them. So we were like, well, we're not going to give you full access logs, but we can let you trace and get some access logs so you can kind of figure out some things. Um, so what this sort of looked like is you know, your user request came in, and it got this trace ID. And the trace ID was sort of uh, tunneled through all the components in the system. And when any particular component would pick it up, it would uh, fire a message off LOS of you know, any information that the developer thought would be useful to kind of decipher what was going on. So this might be like, OK, some state that I normally wouldn't log, but is useful to determine like, what was running at the time. Uh, it could just be information about you know, the request that came in. 
Uh, and then we had two ways to look at this. We had this sort of listener at the top that would just listen to the multicast channel and dump it to standard out. Uh, and then we had the one on the bottom that would kind of listen and stick it into a DB and could read it from a DB from the web server. So in this case, we learned that you know, the real-time listening was, it was very useful for debugging. Uh, but the fact that it was just kind of like somewhat ad hoc uh, meant that many people wrote these little scripts that would just parse it and look at it in various ways. And we didn't really like capture that information anywhere because uh, it was just kind of mostly developers would go and like run a trace, see what was going on. Um, but we kind of also learned that like, yeah, those traces that were in the database, like those were kind of useful because they could kind of go back later and look at them and see if things had changed. Uh, so now, sort of come ahead to where, what I'm doing now, which is display advertising. So in this case, you know, it's, you've got a location on a page. Uh, you need to put an ad there. So you want to find the best ad. And you usually have some information about the user. Maybe you're using some real-time bidding uh, to check at real time, time and you know, folks like AdRoll or um, and ad gear and things like that. Uh, and you just pick the best ad, but if for that point in time, you show it. Um, so in terms of the architecture, well, you know, it's kind of end here again. Uh, we're not really using UDP between the layers. We, we basically sort of settled on thrift, uh, which allowed us to kind of like have the different services be in different languages. Uh, and you know, where before content match had been C, you know, maybe a little C++ pretty much for all the services. Uh, at OpenX, we kind of said, like, OK, we want to try a lot of different things. Um, and this is also kind of the way that you know, Erlang, I was able to get it sort of in the door to OpenX, because we started out with a service-oriented architecture with Thrift, and like, you need to build a new service. And like, hey, it sounds like an Erlang-shaped problem. Can I try doing it in Erlang? And like, uh, you know, you do it, and it does well. And before you know it, a lot of the other services are rewritten in Erlang. Um, but you know, the use cases look a lot the same, you know, because I mean, similar architecture, similar thing. Why is my ad not showing? In this case, it's like you know, a publisher is looking, and they thought they just set up this ad campaign, but it's not on the page they thought it was going to be on. Um, developers, again, have this question of, like, where did my requests go through the system? Like, what machines did it hit? Um, and you have these other things where, well, suddenly you want to know, like, did this change to the subsystem actually do what I expected it to do in the original scenario, which was some production system? Um, and you know, replication issues, like, you don't, how are you going to know the data is not there? If you look for it and it just says it's not there, and you maybe don't have a log, or you maybe aren't watching close enough, you may not see that it hasn't gotten there, or it hasn't gotten to one replica, or something like this. Uh, so we have LWS, uh, but there was another tool that had originally been written uh, at uh, Yahoo for stats um, and log sort of uh, aggregation. And, and so Mondeman kind of had traces added to it. And so it sort of does three different things. It has like the kind of, OK, you can send counters over UDP to a central server, and it'll write them to RDs. You can send logs to it, and it'll sort of keep them all consolidated. But you can also send these traces to it, which kind of be, are a little sort of beefier. Um, and then the server component, uh, it will collect all these traces, and it'll convert them into JSON objects, and sort of has a very simple UI for viewing the objects. Uh, and again, in this case, we had to demarcate the request. Um, the single ID, I guess one thing I, I neglected to mention is with the, uh, with the content match solution where we had this integer and we asked people to just kind of send in a random integer, well, unfortunately, if you have a lot of people, their ability to randomly seed their integers like, isn't very good. So a lot of people tend to pick the same integer. Um, and so you actually can even get conflicts with that. Uh, so in this case, we decided, well, OK, two IDs would actually be good. Like One ID is like your owner ID. And you, you make this something like your username. And the other ID is just some ID, random ID that you pick. Uh, so hopefully, unless you have two people with the exact same username, uh, which usually your operations folks will would probably frown on, uh, they're going to end up with uh, different traces. And you'll be able to de demarcate them that way. Uh, we also, since we don't sometimes have direct access to users, sometimes may not, uh, or sometimes you know, don't have direct access to the request of the user, we've uh, taken to using cookies to kind of set up traces. Uh, and that's worked really well. Uh, again, we take these IDs, we kind of pass them throughout the system, uh, and then you know, again, send these trace messages, although this time through the Mondeman library, which sort of uh, creates a little bit of structure over it. Um, and then the server captures and stores these. 
So in this case, what we end up with is you know, the sort of right-hand side looking very similar, where you just have these requests coming in and IDs passed around. Uh, but what's happening now is there's sort of a, a, a gap between you know, the, the, the actual users and it, which is these JSON files. And what I've neglected to put in here is there, oh, I guess the trace UI, which is at the top, represents you know, like a way to view all of these, these traces. Um, I also have a CouchDB plugin, which I started with. So like, if you need more of a, a database or want more of a database, you can sort of stick these into Couch and, and pull things from them. Um, so again, you know, we learned, well, OK, we need these kind of two IDs. Um, and in some cases, I found that I might need more, but there's ways to do that. Uh, and this tool has proved to be like, invaluable for pretty much everyone. Uh, it's gotten to the point where our QA uses it on a daily basis to do all of their testing. Our customer support uses it like, all the time. Uh, almost every bug report that I've had in the past two years has included a trace showing the failure. Um, and that's really nice as a developer if you can essentially get, uh, here's the failure, and here's a whole bunch of extra data for the failure with the bug report, uh, as opposed to some sort of really vague thing. Um, and the other thing that I learned is that you, know, you really want to capture as much state as you can without sort of really crippling your system when this is happening. Uh, because you, you might need it. <laughs> to figure out what's going on, you may. Uh, so I'm going to go into more of the sort of like nuts and bolts of the talk. And I'm going to talk, go through some really quick basic examples a little bit more. And then I'll kind of show a demo of the UI. Um, so when you're sending a trace from Erlang, it's pretty easy. You know, you install the ModeMan client app. Uh, you probably have some way to get the trace owner and trace ID, and you probably wrap this in some conditional so the traces are only sent when the IDs are set. Uh, but sending it is pretty easy. You have to identify the program. Uh, you, you identify the owner and the ID. Uh, you can attach some sort of message. And then you have this little extra data blob, which I'll get to uh, in a moment. So in this case, you know, I have a web server. I've got an owner ID, and I just want to say, oh, I received a request. Uh, in Java, it's also pretty easy. Um, you know, the, the, the name of the, the program identifier is set in the sort of like client object. Uh, and then when you're tracing a message, it's kind of the same thing. Owner ID, message, some extra data, which is essentially just a, a hash map. Um, on, the, on the Java side, it ends up being just a sort of prop list. Um, there's also a client in, in Python, which, which I didn't include because I'm still working out the licensing. It should be fine, but it's not, uh, it's not yet in here. Um, there's a C library, which we've, we've wrapped in other languages. And it also includes a great uh, command line tool, which you can kind of use as a stopgap in languages that don't have direct support. Because uh, you can just sort of invoke the command line tool. And other than having to specify kind of where the message is going, uh, it's got the same sort of arguments. You give it a, a, an identifier for the program. You give it an owner, an ID, and it's some sort of message. And it's going to send that out. So you can kind of shell out from just about any language and, and do those. Uh, what you end up what the, mon uh, the JSON looks like on the server is pretty much just that information. There's a little bit more that's thrown in here. You get kind of the, the IP address of the machine that sent it and the port and the, the local receipt time. Uh, you get the name of the event. In this case, it's the trace message event. Uh, you get the, the, the machine that sent it. And then you get you know, the program ID, owner ID, message. Uh, we also have sort of set it up so you can kind of, since it's going to turn it into JSON, you can kind of embed JSON right in there to send extra information. So at the top level, it's, it's just a prop list where the, you know, the values can be basically JSON strings. Uh, so in this case, I've just added like this little extra field and stuck in a key value. Uh, but it can be sort of deeply nested however much you want. Uh, looks very similar in Java. You know, you're adding these, these key values. Um, it even looks similar in the uh, command line, uh, where I've just sort of added this extra key value in the trace. Uh, the difference comes in sort of what the JSON ends up sort of looking like, uh, which is I now have this little extra field, and it's got the, uh, the key value sort of embedded right in there. All right, so now I'm going to go and try to uh, demo the UI a little bit. So I kind of made up this like, fake uh, system that's sort of like, um, you know, it's, it's about widgets. And it's got a couple of little services. It's maybe got some sort of user authentication service. It ties to your LDAP database or something. It's got some little widget service that knows about widgets. And then, but that has a call out to some inventory service, because your inventory is stored somewhere else. And uh, so I sort of you know, made a pretend call and made you know, pretend traces just so I could get a very uh, fold out trace message. 
Um, but I can, you know, if you're interested, you can come and I can show you the, 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 the code that sort of does it, um, and I'll probably put it out somewhere at some point. So let's dive over to here. So in this case, uh, you know, this is the name of the, uh, the this it's a little, if it's this large, my buttons are a little bad, but it's got the name of the, uh, the, the owner and the, the trace ID here. And then you get this sort of log of the things that happened. So this says, okay, the web server on this, you know, my local host, it received a request for this URL. I want to get the widget count. Uh, and this has actually got some embedded information. So I can sort of expand it and see that like, okay, I got a request. There was no body, but oh look, there was, here's all the HTTP headers that came in. Um, you know, I got some of this, this basic authentication blob and you know, here's the method that was used. Here's the sort of path that was used. Uh, the IP address, HTTP version. Um, so that's kind of useful information, uh, more, more than you get in your logs normally. Uh, and the first thing it does is it's, it's calling, you know, the get account info of the auth service. And it's, you know, sort of added stuff here. It's passing the token over to your auth service. Um, your auth service is sort of receives this request and it's got the same parameters in there. And you might think like that's a little redundant having them both sort of send out what got sent and what got received. But in reality, like, uh, if you don't have that, it, it, you, a lot of little subtle things can sort of happen. And if you have systems that are not yet trace, traceable and you're sending what I sent them and what I got back, then at least you have that information. Um, and at the very least, that's like the great thing to add. And what things like Xtrace and Zipkin and all these, all they're really doing is sort of adding at those kind of interconnects this information. Uh, so then, you know, that auth service, and you notice the host name here has changed. So it's a different host and it's looking up the account info in the database. And, I made up a little query here. You know, maybe it's like getting something and looking for this particular token. Uh, gets the results, and maybe it has the, like, okay, I've got this account, and I've got this sort of, these are the allowed actions. Um, and this is just a JSON array, but this, the way that JSON arrays end up looking is just sort of indexed hashes and how I can get this to kind of expand and collapse. Um, you know, this returns that same info upstream they get that same info, so here it is. Uh, then there's this here that this is just like, this doesn't expand because it's just a thing that says, oh, that user was allowed to view, so we're gonna use that account. Uh, and then we're gonna call this widget info. You know, the, one of the arguments that I, I had sent in was this like ID, which is, we're assuming the widget ID. So, yep, it's got that ID. It's, you know, sending it over to the widget service. The widget service, you know, gets that, looks at it, and it says, okay, I'm gonna look up this, you know, for account and widget in the widget da database to get more information. You know, maybe it gets some results like, oh, here's a description of it. Here's my spiffy widget. Here's its part number. And then, okay, I'm gonna send a, a get count to the inventory service, and I'm gonna send it for, you know, this part number. Um, and if you're really eagle-eyed, what you'll notice here is that, hey, wait, we have a bug here. Somehow between, like, receiving it and actually sending that, the part number has changed. But maybe we didn't notice that. And, you know, we're going on, we're looking, okay, got this part count out of this, you know, thing, it then sends it back, and oh wait, what it's actually getting is it's getting a count of zero, and it's getting this little note that said part not found. Well, that's kind of interesting, and then we go down to the response, and we're looking like, oh, and then it's returning this re count of zero. And I was really expecting the count to be non-zero, so now I'm, like, confused. You know, from the outside, I'm confused. I had this count of zero, and maybe that's what I'm looking for. But sort of in diving through, you know, you can kind of see how, you know, okay, at this point, what we're actually, you know, finally getting out is like, oh, now I've got zero count in that right number, and then I'm gonna eventually respond to the user down here. Um, and in this case, I don't sort of do anything except say I sent some results back to the user. Uh, but this would allow someone who was sort of diving through and looking for this to kind of figure out that like, oh, there's actually some sort of problem. Uh, and there's actually a couple problems, because A, uh, you know, this probably part not found is maybe an error and not just some sort of note. So maybe this service is really, you know, doing the wrong thing. Uh, or maybe it's a legacy service and that's just how it worked and this is interpreting it wrong. And, well, incrementing the part number is sort of an odd operation. Like, that's probably a bug. Um, so... Okay. So I've sort of, there's my demo. Just wanted to talk about some final thoughts and a few limitations in the system. 
Uh, so this is cool. It requires you know, a bit of work on your side, because you basically have to kind of instrument your applications. Uh, but you know, as I showed, we've tried to make it so that the libraries are not that hard to kind of add instrumentation. Uh, but the important parts are these things that are you know, really more systematic things. So having IDs that can sort of be injected into your system for a particular request, and then having those IDs tr go throughout the system is really useful. Uh, I think that one thing will allow you to do sort of lots of interesting things uh, with your application. At the very least, if you are relying heavily on logging, having a consistent ID through all your components and being able to use you know, Splunk or Sumo Logic or one of these other systems where you can centralize your logging, now you have an ID that you can kind of look. And if that ID is tied to some external input, oh, now I can actually like nail, you know, dive into particular problems uh, and get information about it. Uh, so there are a few limitations to the current one. This first one actually is, uh, is, is now uh, patched and making its way in. Uh, since we were using UDP, uh, you're limited on packet size. And we did find cases where we were sort of attempting to trace things that were greater than the 65K limit. Uh, so the Mondeman library now supports sort of dual protocols. If it's less than 60, 65K, or it's like actually less than that. It's like if it's less than 60K or something, it'll continue to send via UDP. And if it's greater than that, it'll sort of just package it up and uh, do a, a HTTP post over to the, to the same server. Uh, it ends up in the same thing as just a JSON file. It's just sort of an alternate way to send those. Um, the more exciting stuff is, is now that I had this system where I had sort of trained all of my you know, QA folks and customer support to trace problems that they had, I said, hey, these traces have almost all the information that I need to actually like, completely recreate a request on a particular component in my dev system. So what if I just made it so that that worked? Uh, so I have been working on this system that I call Queasy uh, for QA made easy, but also because that should be the feeling that your QA department has when they realize you're taking away their job. Uh, and what it does is it basically uh, provides a way to sort of take a trace and then uh, recreate the request that uh, caused the error and mock out all the services. So you can kind of isolate a single service in your environment. And then it can send in the request. Uh, it'll play through that service. It also allows you to kind of like uh, stick, take any state that you needed and sort of insert it back into the service so that you get the exact same state across the board. And then you should get the same result. Uh, and so this is really nice because essentially it allowed me to sort of like uh, take all of the manual testing that they were doing, uh, record their traces, and turn them into uh, you know, automated tests with uh, very little effort. Um, and hopefully, I'll be able to open source that at some point. And it's still being sort of worked on to kind of scale it across you know, many components. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's working really well. So um, any questions? Yeah, so the fact that our traces are somewhat secret and only used by internal folks means that we haven't really had to undergo any sort of uh, issues with that. We have been denial serviced by internal components that have turned on tracing for everything. And yeah, you sort of drop information, and people tend to notice real quick because it uses the same channels as the statistics, which are used internally a lot. And so people would notice weird statistics issues happening and then do that. Uh, you know, you can address kind of the, the, some of it by, you know, we're pretty open in how we set them internally. We don't let that out, but like, you know, most internal people know how to get a trace set up and they do that. Uh, if we needed to, we could sort of do authorization or do time-based like expiration. Right now, the cookies are usually like five-minute session cookie, you know, so people would have to be kind of like, they'd have to know a lot of our internals and work hard to DOS us, so we haven't encountered that. It'll happen, I'm sure, at some point. Uh, we have actually, we use UDP for all of our other logging. Um, we use LWS to log you know, everything. And 
Uh, in those cases, what we found, and, and I've been using LOS pretty much in every company that I've worked at since about you know, 97, uh, when I first wrote the library. Um, on any gig switched network, UDP, really, really no issue. Uh, we tend to segment, so we end up having like a number of UDP channels, and we basically like partition, and then we send to, to multiple channels, and then dedupe in the back end. Uh, and this is really just to get back to the original things we did at GoTo, which is all multicast, where we'd have two multicast listeners. And in that case, we also split across channels. And usually it was not necessarily for UDP loss, but it, we actually ended up splitting for file size. Because if you're going to capture a bunch of UDP packets and then bulk process them, the time it took to transfer that file off of the system uh, could, could be too long. So you basically would overload the sort of back-end file transfer before you overloaded the UDP sockets. Um, so overall, I'm a sort of really big fan of UDP, mostly because it allows you to do, um, you know, just kind of throw things away when they're not needed. And as long as your system can handle that, which, you know, a lot of the systems I work on can handle a little bit of loss, uh, it's really great because you don't have to have these persistent connections everywhere. And most of the applications can just kind of very quickly package up something in UDP and fire it off to the side. 